last time we spoke about die Frage nach der Technik, heiliges, uh, heiliges Technik aufsetze, heiliges essays on, as we said, techniques, uh, very cautiously, did not translate uh, the German word technik as technology. And given that <clears throat> Heidegger, interestingly, is everywhere, Heidegger is a household name in Silicon Valley, he is a household name in all of uh, North American universities when it comes to philosophy of technology. Um, but the question is in how far maybe technology the word itself, or that translation of the word technique might be a misunderstanding. So that's where we will begin the conversation today, just to think mm -hmm. after um, what these mistranslations or um, sort of the, these uh, communications translations that work with, by the law of correspondence truth, um, how they distort a certain um, Heidegger's way of thinking and what this has to do as well and how what philosophy <clears throat> has become at this point and what Heidegger means by, then we'll come to this in some uh, later in the conversation, Heidegger means by the end of philosophy and the beginning of thinking. So how would you describe, summarize this uh, misunderstanding of Heidegger, Heidegger's word of technique? Heidegger's thought of after technique? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, we probably have to say it's it's understandable that there can be this kind of misconception or misinterpretation because it's 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 tempting to read uh, uh, Heidegger, an important thinker who talks about uh, what in German is called technique. It's tempting to uh, expect that he's saying something about technology, uh, namely something about something which is a concern. There is a concern about uh, modern technology, about the consequences of modern technology. There is an ongoing discourse about um, can we control it? Does it control us? Um, um, how should we handle it? And so on. That is an ongoing discourse. So there comes then uh, somebody called Heidegger who is supposedly... Uh, a thinker of a certain relevance, and he writes about techniques. So what is more tempting than just um, saying, well, he's saying, he, giving us his view yeah. on this phenomenon, which we already know. Yeah. Um, clearly, if we just take the time to read his texts very, very quickly, we, um, he leads us to, a, to, to an understanding, a more adequate understanding of what he means. Um, and this requires, uh, I think we said this last time, that we go away from understanding technique as referring to apparatuses of any kind, so of any technological thing, and that we understand it more from its from from its provenance origin in the Greek word techne, uh, which is a form of knowledge, and a form of knowledge means an understanding of how something comes about, and more specifically, uh, an understanding of how something comes to light. That is what a, a techne is. Um, and so technique is, in turn, um, an understanding of beings in their coming to light, or also then the competence, let's say, in how something is brought to light and brought to light does not mean brought into existence from non-existence into existence. But um, mm -hmm. as I try to say with the word, which I understand is not very easy for a near to accept immediately, uh, it's uh, the knowledge of how something is disabsconded. So brought out from abs abscondedness from more conventionally, we would say, from being hidden, yeah. of, of how something uh, is brought into appearance, let's say. Maybe that's, uh, yeah. that's a, a compromise that we can um, use here for our purposes. So he's asking what is going on when things are brought into appearance in the way in which they're brought into appearance. Clearly also... Um, perhaps, um, or in, in, a, in a way which um, 
which is uh, more immediately striking, for instance, by things that we associate with technology, but not only with that. Mm -hmm. So technic means a manner of coming into appearance of things. And it's and since there is a very peculiar way in which things are brought into appearance, we could even say pushed into appearance or urged into appearance and into a certain kind of appearing, and the light in which they appear is a very peculiar one, yeah. if we look at certain phenomena of our time, there is a legitimate question of asking, well, what is, what is at work here? What is going on uh, in this? And how does this come about? So that's the question that he's asking. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is why he says, he's asking, we said this, I think, in our last conversation, he's interrogating das Wesen, mm -hmm. the, the, the biding of this manner of bringing into appearance and coming into appearance, that is, modern techniques, modern techniques, mm -hmm. as opposed to techne for the Greeks. And now, <clears throat> um, just to open this up further, if, if we say something is being pushed into appearance, what is it that does the pushing? Or well, is that already leading astray from where we need to go? No, oh, no, no. Um, we just have to be a bit careful to, uh, <laughs> with, the, with, with, the, with language. Yeah. Uh, but, um, well, one way to, to indicate this, um, maybe an economical way, uh, is to say it's, it's the will, it's the will to will, it's uh, things are willed into appearance. And so this urging is a being willed. So something is willed to appear because yes. the will um, avails itself of this appearance in order to will itself. So if we take the will to will um, as being the what, what is act, acting here in the first place, mm, let's just say, uh, use the word acting, it's fine. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's the will to will that is acting in the first place, and the will to will wills things to appear in a certain way, and yeah. we can further describe that way. He the, the, then the, the manner of appearing is um, uh, a certain form of availability of things, mm -hmm. an availability for uh, planning, steering, controlling. In the first place, computing. Mm -hmm. So things must appear in a computable. Uh, manner, in a, so so that they can be calculated, because that is in turn a presupposition for them to be included into operative circuits. Mm -hmm. that we, can, we could characterize them as cybernetic circuits, yeah. which have a structure, and which um, through through which this uh, what I characterized as uh, planning, steering, controlling, and so on uh, is implemented, and. All of this is, again, the, the, the way in which the will wills itself. Hmm? So um, a, a trait of this being, <laughs> being uh, of this will to appearing, hmm? yes, but not of the single thing, but the, um, this will for things to appear is then its exclusiveness. So that, that kind of appearing then, um, the one which is characteristic of modern techniques, does not really tolerate um, other ways of appearing next to it. So um, it, is, um, it is not um, tolerant in that respect. So, and, and also there is not, uh, when we go at this level of um, identifying what is acting here fundamentally, there is also no um, mixture of things. It's not that in par partly it's this and partly it's that, then we really have to identify what is it. I mean, and it's one thing, it's one. Yes. So there's a certain, can we say there's a certain dimensionality that's being opened up thanks to which beings appear as formatable, op, op, operatable op, op, <laughs> um, formats um, that are part of a circuit measurable, quantifiable, <clears throat> reusable, and in a sustainable manner, cir circling around itself. And, but the question then is, if that's <clears throat> the, the, the ex exclusive way in which beings appear and, are, and appear means are meaningful to us, mm -hmm. um, then how is it that, say, Heidegger can see that way of appearing? Mm -hmm. That binding. Well, but exclusive refers to the 
inner structure of what we are trying to describe. Um, perhaps we need to distinguish between exclusive and absolute. Uh, he does that yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> in itself, exclusive, so not, as I said before, not uh, tolerant um, with respect to other ways of coming into appearance or letting other appear. Other ways are still, exactly, that's, that's, so other ways are still. But, but our, the, the, very, the very fact that we are diagnosing this, uh, yeah. Attempting to describe it implies that it's not absolute because um, f f so within itself it, 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 it doesn't want to be diagnosed so it just just wants to operate it the will just yeah. wants wills to will yes. so the, the very the very circumstance that we are doing what we are trying to do um, implies that we are already um, that we have a de what we could call a degree of liberty with respect to it. Yes. Otherwise, you could from from the inside. You cannot. You can only implement it. You cannot diagnose it. So uh, it's always um, there is. Uh, there can always be misunderstandings when yeah. we start from the inside, the outside. It's not that we are standing out. We are <laughs> because there is no outside of techniques in that sense. But yeah. the 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 inside is such that one can gain this. Um, this degree of freedom or this possibility of diagnosing it. So the, the inside is, is um, of that sort. And the, <clears throat> say, what, what is it then uh, that, that prompts Heidegger, one could almost say, to, from what standpoint is it that, that his thinking speaks? Mm -hmm. From inside, from from the very heart of it, because uh, it, it is precisely when you when you gain some insight, because we never know. I mean, what, we can never be sure uh, clearly that what we are seeing is um, is um, is has truth to it. But yeah. the very moment in in which you see, in which you have an insight into what he calls das Wesen der Technik, yeah. in that moment you 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 have that freedom. So he's strictly talking from from the core of it, or from what he can see is the core of it, because that that is already the point in which it, it is not absolute anymore. Because what you what you see is you see mm -hmm. the we can call it uh, being itself. You you see that this is one manner in which being itself acts unfolds. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and when then you go further into um, into experiencing and, uh, and and observing how this takes place, and especially how this involves a relation to the being of man, to the, to the human being, uh, then then you s start to learn something about the the becoming of this and the transformations of this and you see that this is one version of something which can have other versions but in order to see that you need to to go into the, the structure of it and especially this the relation that it has um and the need that it has of our understanding in order to uh, to work in the way in which it works and uh, and this is what Heidegger describes as uh, as Ereignis. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the das Wesen der Technik is one version of uh, Ereignis. And uh, but th the moment you have um, uh, because th that's the way that he takes because that's the way it appears to him. It leads him to to um, descri describe this uh, this structure, this relation between being itself and man as uh, in that form. And um, which implies this struct. Let's call it a structural moment um, th that he calls uh, kere, a turning in itself. So there is different ways in in which it can turn out. So to yes, speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is one in which um, <coughs> let's say truth and and sense are completely withdrawn. Yeah, and 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 and, and refused, and man is. Uh, thrown into a, a dimension in which uh, n no sense and no seems to hold anymore mm -hmm. um, l let's say that's a in a way it's a, it's it's his um, manner of um, 
understanding what what we know as a, as a tragic <laughs> as a tragic um, constellation. Uh, but it's that tra- tragic constellation is also one which allows us to gain an insight into um, into yeah. what is going on. It's in in a way it's the more it's the the didactically more fertile one uh, because we understand things we we come to see things even though in a manner which is um, I, I described as, as tragic so mm-hmm. uh, and which involves um, that the, the the dimension in which we uh, exist is uh, devoid of, of of meaning and sense we learn we get to see things which perhaps we do not get to see in uh, in a different turning of this when everything is just richness and everything is full of sense and sense is bestowed on us in 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 in, in, in great abundance yeah so what you call what you refer to as tragic is not and i'm trying to i'm asking questions in this manner just so that <clears throat> precisely because the, the 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 notion of dimension has come up and you know, there's there's something I, I could leap to which is to, to say that modernity suffers from and especially this epoch that we we have, we've entered of a certain one dimensionality which is what might be leading back to the will itself because the will needs to operate and therefore it needs to exclusively operate and exclude everything that that stops it from willing its operations mm-hmm. um and <clears throat> what I notice in very often in uh, speaking to people, speaking publicly, is that if you use notions, speak with words like tragic, it's associated with fatalism, with non freedom, with determinism. You see all these isms that then immediately leap in because they're, they're kind of, they're, they're, there's a certain shock almost that comes when, when you say, oh, you know, we're. We're in a, thrown into a dimension where mm-hmm. I think though when what I hear when you say tragic is that what it seems to uh, indicate is that it's the the tragedy is that we have to respond and we are tragic beings fully uh, in full appreciation and affirmation of of our tragic essence if you like of reason um, if we respond. And if, if if we don't respond, we fail to be tragic beings. And then we are actually just figures in a in a game that we don't don't even see or want to see. And we just enact. We become enforcers of of machen, of machin, of machination, of mm-hmm. em, em, of <clears throat> em, employing um, certain structures that we that we think empower us, but we are at the mercy and of something else that works through us rather than being tragic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, first of all, just quickly, t- talking about dimensions, we also yeah. we always have to specify what we mean yeah. uh, when, when we use certain words. For instance, I could also say um, what, we de- what we have been describing um, up to now, uh, this, will to, the, this will to will with its circuits, we, can, we, could, we could also... Uh, describe it as a dim- as a dimensionlessness. There is no dimension. Not only just there is one dimension. <laughs> there is no dimension. If with that, if we have a ri- rich understanding of the word dimension, we could also say that the will is the operating of these circuits is exactly what surrogates any kind of dimension uh, in which a sense of something can unfold. But that was just a, on the side. Um, now, uh, clearly, uh, I did something dangerous. I was I was taking a, a shortcut with <laughs> with the reference to uh, to the tragic, but my, I, I I was using it in a if you so will in a in a technical in a technical sense. Um, and that, that, that the word tragic here just in, in the use I'm making of it just refers to a let's call it a a constellation in which uh, now I'll try to be. Um, <laughs> plastic uh, in which the sense is sucked out of, of the world mm-hmm. i don't the poets know about this and um and and, and and describe it it's sucked out of out of the world and man is thrown into this or, or finds himself in this um in this um senseless um, world and um 
and, and there is nothing we can do about that. In the way. This, this is not, not something we can change by some uh, by voting against it or something. Now that man has, to, and this is the the, the tragic character is just um, meeting uh, or having an experience uh, of being in, in when 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 being um, refuses sense. It shows its its um, not so pleasant side uh, to us, and it shows also that we are involved in this, that we are, so, because it has always to go through the human being. Mm? So it, it shows us this uh, um, not so pleasant side of it, side of it with our involvement in it. Mm? But um, in itself, that is not, not, to see this, which we can describe as a tragic situation, is not nothing tragic and then there is no <laughs> fatalism. The thing is that we learn that man always has to respond, yeah. always. And we learn it precisely, yeah. so that's the, the, the we learn it even better in what what we are calling a, a tragic constellation, because um, what, what better occasion to learn that that always the, the human being collaborates and necessarily collaborates with what is truth, with uh, what is being, with the way in which things can appear and so on. That the human being collaborates fundamentally with that, in his, her own being. Mm? To be a human being means to collaborate with this um, law that governs the way in which things come into appearance. Mm? And the, the, the tragic constellation is um, a, a unique um, opportunity to, to come to realize that, because what, what I described before is the, the, the constellation of abundance of sense there, just we are just busy in doing things with this richness and in, in yeah. celebrating it, and yeah. in which is fine, which is. Um, <laughs> um, I, I'm. I, I should say that what I'm, what I have in the back of my head when I say yeah. this is what my understanding of the way in which um, Hölderlin, for instance, characterizes the tragic. He has a very very. Um, sharp way of um, of of characterizing it and this i should just say I don't, I don't know if my understanding of it is sufficient or adequate but i should say that i have this in the back of my head um so the, so we, we 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 learn that the human being collaborates and this also means that thinking has from that a directive as to where thinking should go thinking should go into clarifying this involvement, this uh, collaboration of the human being in that. And um, this is what he tries to do. And, um, and what, what also Heidegger always says is he says, well, we cannot change that, but certainly we also know that the, the turning, the way in which it turns will not change if we are not looking in that direction, if we are not attentive to the fact that we are involved in this, if we are completely distracted from that or turn, Heraclitus would say, if we turn completely the other way, um, then this um, this turning in the way in which this uh, in this stru structure works is not is not likely to uh, to take place. So <clears throat> there are counter swings gegen Schwünge within the turning mm -hmm. and as Heidegger sometimes speaks of the, the few and rare, for example, in contributions to philosophy. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned Heraclitus, uh, not to be too broad, but there is a sense, in a sense, we, we respond to something that we hear. The, mm -hmm. the, the sense of hearing of is quite important. There is, there is something, there's a question posed to us that we are asked to respond. Mm -hmm. And in... I think because, you know, there is the notion of crisis is everywhere uh, at, at the moment. And it, it's, it's, it's funny enough, it's increasing um, that what Nietzsche saw, the, the nihilism is, is the history of the next 200 years, um, that we are entering the phase of an uncanny wheel work uh, of total economic management of the earth, the last man lives longest, almost prophecy, you could say. There's talk now um, of, of a meaning crisis. Um, there's, there's a certain collapse uh, of, of institutional structures. Um, 
and as some people say that the future is unevenly distributed so it's it's crumbling in some places and not crumbling in other places as much um but in sort of because <clears throat> i'm the the reason i ask questions like this is because there is this there is almost a, a you could say a demand for uh making sense of what's going on but um i and i think and there's 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 this draw now to, to that i realized to heidegger uh and his way of of thinking because he is at the almost at the 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 edge of something in between of of between an old world and and something to come and he seems to be responding to something that he has a, a that he sort of hears you could say um so the the question is how what would a what would responding look like what is it that we respond to how do we respond um and then and i know the, these are very you know precise questions but this is just so that maybe people who are not too familiar with it can can find an access uh, an, an entrance into it is um how then this response or, or, or ways of responding feed into the turning of Ereignis, and and maybe you could also say it just a, a bit more on the Ereignis itself, on how we could think of it. Mm -hmm. Well, they you're, you're asking um, <laughs> to go into something which is not um, easy to uh, to say quickly, but um, there's all the time. I don't know. I see. I see uh, this whole thing uh, from the point of view of. Um, the, the the task that one has as somebody who is attempting to to just to think what is going on there is uh, it's f fairly s simple I should say because the thing is that all, all you can do is try to try to describe as rigorously as possible uh, and trying not to make too many mistakes or to see things which are not there and to describe as rigorously as possible what is going on in terms of um, what we have been calling now fundamental uh, structures yeah. and uh, all these uh, traits which now you mentioned some of them and counter swing and so on those are just very basic descriptions of what of what thinking experiences in the moment in which it uh, comes into uh, into into um, closeness to what is going on fundamentally so those are plain descriptions, which clearly, if we, understandably, if we uh, get to them from uh, having done our shopping, uh, I mean, everybody of us, I mean, uh, Heidegger himself, you know, uh, he says, well, what is what is this? I mean, it's crazy, right? But th but then if we take, it, it's, it's a matter of patience. And also it's a matter of if we have a sense for these things, which not everybody must uh, necessarily have, there is no law that forces everybody to have a sense for that and those who maybe have a sense for that and uh, and, and, and access to that they it's there is no merit uh, in this it, it's just somebody's good at something other people are good at other things or more drawn to certain things so it's very it's all very simple now um to get back maybe or closer to what you were asking again um there is a realization of uh, Let's call it an, uh, an, uh, the, in the moment you get closer to the, the fundamental level where the way in which things turn happen, there is the realization that uh, there is another likelihood, as I would prefer to say, let's just call it another possibility. Things can turn in a different way. You, you get to understand how a richness of sense can come about, but then you, you, you don't do anything else than that, than just insisting in this point this is what also philosophy always has done you you the attempt of thinking philosophical thinking and this thinking which for certain reasons again if you so will technical ones we cannot call philosophical anymore yeah. is to insist in the po insist and in, I, I mean not insisting in the sense of that but really it literally insist standing as as much as one can uh, and as long as one can and as rigorously as one can insisting in the point in which the human being is um, is needed in order to um, uh, let a, a dimension of sense arise. 
this is the only job that thinking has, the exclusive one, in, in, in a fundamental sense, is yeah. this insisting. And and uh, the fact that then things like uh, being in time or the Beiträge zur Philosophie uh, come into existence is a document of thinking just attempting to take a stance in this in this point uh, and nothing else and in this point in this as you said in this uh, non abundance of sense in this withdrawal of sense in which we in which we have to find a stand but which then could be the the sowing of seeds for a, a, a more abundant uh, time to come quite quite necessarily because there is this sensation of a withdrawal mm -hmm. and non-appearance of sense and not richness but poverty at the moment mm -hmm. or indigence we could say yes if we want to save the word poverty for for other uses yes yeah. yeah yeah um yeah and um because this is an ereignis as well it's not just you know so it's the first furthest thing possible from from fatalism but but because yeah. But not because it's the opposite of fatalism, but because that is not the level. That is a level that we would describe with the German word uh, Weltanschauung, you know, um, from fatalism yeah. or not fatalism. Those are those are positions with regard to things happening or not happening and so on, which is just not the place where uh, thinking is. Hmm? And um, uh, also, the, when, when you when you get into the uh, the, the, the proximity of this this uh, this point, uh, this initial point or point of initiation, also um, you also you get you get very um, cautious <laughs> um, cautious with respect to uh, your position on the actual happening of something or not happening of something because. You just get a sense for um, because you get you get the sense of the priority of the sense question, <laughs> let's say, yeah. um, and how this is not for man to control and for man to um, have in his hand, uh, uh, but, all, but also not just something which uh, you know on, on the level of sense. It's also not not uh, there is what saves us from again falling into fatalism and so on, is this um, clear understanding of our role uh, in it. Now, another thing is that you you realize that w this, what we described before as this possible uh, other way of turning, um, is something which which maybe demands a completely new approach uh, in thinking. Uh, but, but the only thing that Heidegger says in this respect, there is a video on this when he, and it's also... Um, there was also a written document of that when yeah. he speaks to this he says I bow in front of somebody whom I don't know yeah. who yeah. a thousand years ahead of him and so on he, he's, and, and he probably is the first one to think that when when somebody else comes and, 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 and makes another and has another go at this yeah. uh, the matters it, it will have to be from a completely different approach uh, he just says well what I've tried to see uh, I guess that this is, in a way, he or she will 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 somewhere have to go through this because that it seems to me that this is a crucial point which I try to identify. Yeah. And let's not not uh, last thing um, um, forget that it's but what, what he's doing. I mean, he's uh, it's tricky what he's uh, and uh, and, uh, and and uh, and uh, and the uh, tough job that he that he for, for what he could try to. Um, to make to do because it's 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 the moment in which we have to we are still completely up to here within a, a metaphysical way of thinking and yeah. to get to find a way out from that a, a delicate one which which um, which uh, maintains our rootedness in the same origin as metaphysics yeah. I mean that kind of I mean this um, and, and and so so this is a um, a task which is also in a way limiting. This is why probably he he will he will, he will have thought well somebody else will have a completely I'm, I'm working for somebody else I'm doing I'm doing some tough uh, 
uh, work for, for somebody else who will then have to rethink the whole thing anew, but maybe benefiting mm -hmm. from this, yeah. um, this uh, what I try to do in terms of finding a transition, let's say, or defining, or just even defining what the transition in, in involves. Yes. Uh, now, I will be uh, maybe too succinct or too narrow, but what, what, <clears throat> because <clears throat> so, you know, when we speak of philosophy, a philosophical thinker, the philosopher diagnoses a certain age, but then Heidegger does say what there's, there's the end of philosophy has been reached, and we need to, we need to figure out what this could mean. Um, but also, this doesn't mean <clears throat> he's not, um, say, a, a futurist in the sense of futurismo that just cut off what was and only look to the future, um, an imagined techno fantasy. Uh, but there is in what, what we could tentatively, very cautiously call the history of metaphysics. I, you know, I'm not too keen on the word history. You can um, maybe explain then why. Um, there is something as you would say, I guess, absconding within that, or say concealed, um, something's <clears throat> something lingering mm -hmm. in that in that Geschichte, in that moment, um, which needs which because he does say, I think in the Ereignis uh, that the, the the andere Anfang is nur in Bezug auf den ersten Anfang. So the other beginning is only true or genuine or there if it relates to as it relates to the first beginning um <clears throat> so maybe we could say a, a, a bit more what what heidegger means by geschichte by and then move on to the the end of philosophy and, and what this other thinking then might look like or what it what it what he thinks this thinking has to to do to achieve to uh, what its task and its uh, its, its Auftrag uh, is. Well, uh, Geschichte, we, we just have to decide <laughs> do we um, want to find a quick way to say something or... No, no. Um, if we, no, no, if we go that, yeah. that road, well, we can say Geschichte is the same as Ereignis because what we tried to describe before, yeah. that Ereignis, we are looking at a, a a structure of of uh, that involves the origin of sense in its relation to man. Yeah, the ereignis is the structure of that. We are, we are, what we're describing is um, a, a modality of generation and the way in which sense is generated and a, a truth is generated because the truth is always. The that we can call it a dimension, a space of time of that certain collaboration between man and uh, the, the origin of sense. Um, and so, Ereignis itself has a generative capacity, generates. Hmm? So, mm -hmm. this generating um, of always, just to call it with the, with the words that he uses, the generating each time of a, of a truth of a dimension of disabscondedness and of disabsconding, of coming into appearance once again, the generating of this uh, of this dimension, this is uh, Geschichte. Geschichte just means the, um, the, the, the gathering in the way of Ereignis of these, the, these generated uh, dimensions of the truth for beings, yeah. in favor of beings, meaning yeah. in favor of their appearing in a certain sense. Hmm? Uh, and so also this, uh, um, what we described before as the tragic constellation, this is uh, one, Heidegger would say, one Geschichte, one generation in this, um, in, w within, within this uh, structure that, um, that we've been describing. Um, now, the, the end of philosophy, as, as you know, there is a text uh, uh, that... That is called um, the end of philosophy and the task of thinking, yeah. which is from the early uh, '60s, in which um, Heidegger is very clear about that. I, I think if one reads that text, there is, uh, as usual, I mean, uh, there it's uh, it's so clear that, especially what he means by end, um, is that is uh, laid out very um, very clearly. Um, 
the end of philosophy, um, he just means, it, it, well, it, to talk about the end of philosophy implies that what one has, first of all, a rigorous notion of what philosophy is, and that one has, does not have a, a generic notion of what it is, that's just, you know, or, or a historical notion. Hmm? If yeah. one just has a historical notion of philosophy, it's that form of thinking which begins with, say, Socrates and so on. Yeah. And to talk about the end of philosophy means that line of, the, of, of that succession, of that sequence of philosophical positions, suddenly, boom, comes to a halt, which <laughs> I don't, doesn't understand why, because yeah. Heidegger decides it, because, yeah, you know, yeah. everything becomes yeah. arbitrary and meaningless. And yeah. <laughs> This is very often uh, the criticism leveled against Heidegger. Yeah, it is. Point this out, right? It's a cri- yes. How, how, it's, how can he be the one who decides that this is the end of philosophy, which is a, a crudely linear understanding of time and Geschichte, and, of, and you know, see, seeing philosophers and thinking itself as points along this uh, line that, that somehow just crop up for, for whatever reason. Yeah, maybe we could say that um, these misunderstandings are very often the, the consequence of the fact that we are not defining our terms. It, it's just basic, yes. let's say, scientific practice. So define your terms uh, and I and make sure that when you use a certain word um, that you check whether the one you are criticizing is using it in the same way. And now since, since Heidegger is all thinkers, philosophers, defines his terms, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, make a mystery out of what he means by philosophy. You know? uh, there are probably about a few thousand pages in which he keeps on saying, this is what, when I say philosophy, this is what I mean. So, yeah. so it's not difficult. He's not hiding it. So, and especially in that, in that essay, he's not hiding it. And we know that when he talks about philosophy, yeah. he uses that as a synonym of, of metaphysics. And he means uh, the interrogation of beings in regard of their their being or the origin of their, which has the structure of the ground. Hmm? So he, yeah. philosophy as metaphysics means starting from beings once they have shown in their being character and going beyond these beings in the direction of their being character, tr- attempting to grasp that being character in its principle, say the idea of the good um, yeah. in Plato, so that then we can come back to beings and now beings are well-grounded on that principle of their sense of their meaning. That is the metaphysical movement. And this is what he tries, there are about, I don't know, 50 volumes in which he tries to trace this structure in yeah. all fundamental philosophical positions. Now, well, if you, now we can say that he's, uh, we can always find out that what he says is, uh, he's completely wrong and uh, everything is erroneous, but at least we should appreciate that this is what he means. Okay. Now, since this is what he means with uh, with philosophy, suddenly you realize that something with after also with German idealism already and with Hegel and especially then with with Marx, something happens. Yeah. And suddenly, uh, what he would, what this what then Nietzsche will come to call the inversion of Platonism uh, it takes place. Something takes place, but within this so this movement, this metaphysical structure is um, is maintained but something happens which is clearly the the, the, the indication that, w- that there are no more once this is done let's say what nietzsche does w- once that is done where else should we go within this structure that we have identified it's something very specific and very something that can be laid out very clearly you realize that this is nowhere to go and we can even if we read nietzsche a bit attentively and um we, we, we can presume, maybe you have to presume, that he himself had some kind of uh, awareness of this, just that in a way he reala- he experiences the end of metaphysics from, you know, in a sense, from within metaphysics, which is yeah. incredible. I mean, something, so what the, that person had to go through, <laughs> that human being. Yeah. Because he, 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 he was, the, the, what he was working for was for a, for a remedy a remedy against this, what he, he was seeing that this, the, the yeah. way in which metaphysics was going was, it was dissolving. That's what he yeah. calls the nihil. And, and he was trying to find a remedy, but yeah. within the same <clears throat> structure, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another one. So he was trying to draw sense f- from out of the senselessness. 
um, you know, <laughs> so he was really extracting sense from there. That it's, yeah. it's a huge thing what he tried to do. Yeah. Uh, it's one thing with how how can you not go cr- cr- crazy? I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's the kind of thing that he was. It's, uh, I don't I, I don't want to use the word heroic, but it's I mean what this. So, and and if you if you now if you look at this from you, we must always remember that what we call Heidegger's thinking. All of this depends on the fact that there is a fundamental experience uh, to begin with. And without that, nothing can be said, not even one word. So Heidegger already is born in, this ex- in the experience in which something else is going on, which then gives him this, what we before called this degree of liberty. He can, he can experience this, this last likelihood within metaphysics as such, because in order to experience this as something which is still within metaphysics, which has to do with Nietzsche's diagnosis of nihilism. As you know, there is that's a very important point. Heidegger's notion of nihilism and Nietzsche's are fundamentally different, and Heidegger uh, rightly so um, uh, explains that very well in his Nietzsche lectures. Um, so, from 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 his from where he stands within the same. Um, origin, because there is only one, I mean, how many can there be? So um, w- within the same origin, uh, or the same arche, the Greeks would say, he stands in it in a different way, so that this, w- what is taking place um, in metaphysical terms becomes visible to him as such, including what, that, what we can, I think, fairly then uh, recognize as a last possibility, and and from and the next step then is that you realize how once that has happened, um, and Nietzsche did that for us, and Hegel and Marx in a different sense. Yeah, Nietzsche did that. You 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 then you you also have a a, a way of diagnosing what takes place in terms of the dissolution of this, but it's like a, a spillover yeah. uh, of this into the sciences. Mm-hmm. So everything that ha- is to be said about sense that concerns the human being that becomes now the competence of humanities anthropology and so on um, and everything that has to be said about the fundamental structure of the world becomes a competence of uh, natural natural sciences and there we would have to talk about um, about the modern science what that implies in terms of mathematization and so on and yeah. you, you realize that the, the this coming to uh, as he says to the point to its to its point of point of ending um where where everything comes together that this apparently now has the form of this dissolution this spilling into the into the sciences and yeah. i think that this is something uh, that we can observe today the fact that today when we turn if we have to choose to whom do we turn when we want to know the truth about things, about the, the material world, uh, we turn to physics or to... Yeah. If we want to know something about the, um, the human world, we turn to probably uh, neuroscience uh, today. And, um, and um, I, I nobody would, I think, in a way, a, 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 an experimental way of... <laughs> Of verifying this, what he calls the the end or the the, the ending of philosophy, is that nobody would would um, have the strange idea to turn to a philosopher to with, with the question of what is going on today, what is what are things, what is the truth about things today. So this that that is a, a way to to get a sense for how the the metaphysical um, f- way of thinking. Yeah. Um, it, as Heidegger says, d- does not get to that which is anymore. Where, where now, when he says to getting or attaining what is, the yeah. is means that fundamental structure. And so now we reserve now the word being for for Ereignis itself, and what yeah. uh, n- neither. Um, so m- m- since metaphysics interrogates beings as to their being intended as a ground. Um, it cannot get to that point, to that which is this uh, this structure that we identify as, um, or that he then describes and calls a right. Uh, Cut off from that ground. 
or that from being well, it's just uh, in that perspective, you, you because that perspective precisely, uh, in a way, it, uh, implies that you don't see that point. <laughs> so the, the the blindness for that point is yeah. intrinsic in the metaphysical interrogation. So yeah. neither neither metaphysics nor nor science, which yeah. without metaphysics and, and but, can see that. Yeah, which is uh, striking because often what could happen is that. Oh, the, the word being uh, evokes um, connotations of mysticism, right? Or theology. So it, it's, it has to leap from out of its immediate operations, uh, this way of representing the world, and then has to say, oh, what Heidegger is talking about really is God, or is some sort of weird mysticism, or uh, is something <clears throat> very mysterious uh, that we um, you know, you don't have to worry about. <laughs> Too much because it's, it's it's somewhere over there in the world of fantasy and fairy tales. Anyway, anyways, um, and what you're describing, I, I, if I understand it, you know, correctly, um, is that what metaphysics has provided has now been taken over by the the, the fields of the sciences, um, as Heidegger quotes from 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 Descartes, the, the tree of of the science, the tree of knowledge, is that the, the roots are metaphysics and it goes mm -hmm. up to physics. Uh, <clears throat> and so in, in that sense, this way of an operational thinking doesn't require the question of being because it can, it can extract what it needs to, what it wants to know from its various fields mm -hmm. um, of, of, uh, of knowledge uh, generation for the sake of, Keeping the operations of the cyber circuit uh, running, right? Which is why it has to attack language as well. Well, um, it, 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 yes, I, we have to be careful yeah. again. Um, yeah, it it, re, it it requires it. I mean, it's uh, mathematical physics. Yeah, is clearly a, 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 a functional theory of, for instance, time and so on. It wants to explain how the material world the world works and so on, but. Uh, and it doesn't talk about being and so on, but it's the only, in a sense, the only thing it talks about is being. Just it has, it has an operative version of that. Hmm? So it's uh, the basic assumptions uh, of um, of physics. They are just interpretations of the being of beings. So it's uh, it, it, Heidegger says, uh, science in that text, uh, the end of philosophy and the. Yeah task of thinking he says well the, clearly the sci sciences they 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 turn the, the what what is an understanding of being into an operative assumption um and and they they make um uh, they use as a criterion for judging these assumptions just uh, uh, functional criteria so how 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 well does a certain assumption work in terms of the kind of model or expl explanatory um, theory that I can build. So there is a, um, a, a judgment on um, on basic assumptions uh, based on their effectiveness in terms of model building and so on. But it's um, it's ways of determining the being of beings. So the, the, the being is there is nothing more concrete than being. But it, it has always been like that. Even in, unfortunately. Uh, you know, Plato is the most you know hands-on guy that you know. It, unfortunately, there were there are these one or two passages in Plato when he talks about you know go, going on uh, this carriage and so on, going to the Hyperaneus and where we then see the which which is just an image that he in a certain context, and and from there we have this uh, misunderstanding that yeah. about things which are in, in in other sky in up in the sky and so on, but. I think no philosophers. Uh, I yeah. think philosophers are very, yeah, very concrete uh, beings. It's that, it's that Geister metaphysik, mm. that goes metaphysics. But um, <clears throat> what I and I'm not sure I can make this uh, halfway understandable. If, if even has any sense. It, what I what I think what I find what struck me at some point over the years of, of reading and maybe thinking as well. Um, <laughs> is this access that we all of a sudden have in this moment to what we call, what we in general refer to as history, in, in general, which is what how common sense would think of history. 
is that we we gaze upon epochs past and and it's all seemingly accessible to us it's and it's it becomes everything becomes ex- weirdly arbitrary also with so-called philosophy right you can you can be an epicurean i, I take a bit from i'm i'm a neoplatonist because it's all standing readily available for for operations again and this is uh, but but this doesn't stop with philosophy obviously this this is also in, in the historical sciences itself and anthropology or even just the regular historicism um <clears throat> in terms of geography uh and and the the history say of the planet if that even makes sense to to speak of, of that in terms of without thinking of the, the human being and such a such a thought um so I, I i wonder if 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 first of all if i can get across what i'm trying to say but also um whether this has something to do with how uh, Agnes unfolds in our epoch mm-hmm. is this 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 sudden availability of everything and mm-hmm. this historicizing and, and that, that that also that that events let's just say become or are historicized even before they take place so we we're, we're in this weird loop of of almost uh, seemingly timeless, you could say, or I think one of the words you used with what, what was it, temposidal? No, so, so uh, there's this, this uh, a weird timeless sphere almost that, that wants to be timeless, um, but that that kind of presents everything as images of readily available for for any kind of uh, sort of mental operation. Um, it's, is that something that you w- that that has to do with with where we are, or is this um, how would how would you respond to what I'm trying to say? Mm-hmm. Um, well, but uh, if you just uh, look at the words that you've been using, you, you yeah. will realize that you were using this exactly the, the same words, or you were describing something which is exactly what we were trying to describe at the beginning when we are talking about uh, techniques as a way of letting things appear. You, you talked about things uh, in this historical um, perspective, things are available and for op- op- operations and so on. And this goes both ways. It goes uh, to the past, what we yeah. call the past, and it goes into the future. Where So everything is, let's say, computed, in all directions, you know, whether it is, it has already happened or it, it is uh, yet to happen. Um, so what we're describing is exactly the way in which what, what has been and what is still to come appears in a technical environment. So the, the fact that the human being today is a, is a technical animal um, is the same as saying it is a historical animal. In historical, we um, perhaps we cannot understand that word it's it's helpful to yeah. understand it in etymologically um th- because there are different ways in which it can be understood. heraclitus has the word histo in a very prominent and rich sense but we can um, just um, refer to its meaning as being a a, a witness uh, and a witness who is in a way uh, looking at something from a distance and without being involved in it now for us this position of being uh, a witness um, a, that is not involved and who looks at something uh, like uh, I think uh, Heidegger himself talks about this historical balcony at some point. Yeah. So we look yeah. down on everything, yeah. and we have everything at our disposal. We 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 have everything. Then we can look at it in any moment without any kind of effort. We can we have everything there for us to look at it. And so that's this balcony view, or uh, Barnett Newman would say from the from the mountain down. Uh, the painter Barnett Newman would call it from the mountain down view in which we have everything under control. Now, we have to ask what is required for things, including events, including where we come from and where we go to, to be available in that form. Well, there is a form of, let's call um, objectifying, which is required for things to have that that, uh, quality of availability for us. Mm -hmm. And that is, and, and that objectifying is, once again, a manner of letting things appear. And it's the same one that we were describing before when we were talking about uh, or trying to elucidate what uh, what techniques means in terms of a manner of letting things 
a pair of kind of things coming into appearance. So the his, the technical man has a historical perspective on everything. But even the mathematical scientist, when he looks into the depth of the galaxies, has yeah. a historical eye. So we yeah. we can talk about the historical the eye, which is the eye of the technical animal. Yeah, the witnessing eye, just to say. This. Yeah, but but what the important because it's important always to say this. The, the, because witness can we can also understand it in different ways, but yeah. it's uninvolved with witness meaning. And when I say uninvolved, I don't I don't mean that we are uh, like uh, we don't have we don't relate to things. Or uh, uninvolved means that um, the our attentiveness for what we before called the the involvement of the human being in the letting appear and letting come about of things yeah. is we is is not there anymore. And this is a, ca- a character of the end of metaphysics and its dissolution in the sciences and the yeah. fact that our knowledge of things is there. What is the a fundamental trait of that or a character that we must see when we, um, when we describe uh, the end of philosophy in these terms is that in these forms of knowledge, this yeah. fundamental involvement of man yeah. is not there uh, anymore, is not, is not seen uh, and not uh, taken into account anymore so that we can have Functional theories of time, where time is something which yes. goes on by itself and not something which makes sense only with respect to the human being. Same thing for space. Mm? And once you have time and space in this operative functional uh, way, yes. in the, with the historical eye um, gazing on it as uh, as uh, objects of of some computation of some of some explanatory model, yes. um, then you have the the technical world. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the again when when I when when I when I look into the in a way already into an electrical telescope I have a I have this historical eye on things and and, and physicists they talk about the fact that we look into the past right so yeah. because we get these light signals and so on yeah. which is something very very serious it, it's, it's it's just that what, what I, t- I tend to think that when Mathematical physics talks about time and, and and going into the past and so on. It's not we're not talking about time, hmm? but we're yes, talking about yes. something real. Yes, yeah, but not about time. Hmm? It's a histo- it's a historical technical version of uh, yeah, of, um, which probably we, we would have to call in a different way. It's a derivative of of temp- of a certain temporality, or is it? Uh, what, how would you? But 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 this is how clock time how the time as a parameter time as a means of of controlling this transcendental uh, grid that we've kind of erected around this globe um uh, it's, it's how time is that operational is it a tool um it um by by which um we we access uh not not just this by which we uh, try to make sense of the world, I guess. I, but what what would you call what is usually referred to then as time? And maybe then also how, how what is authentic, what is real, what is true time, genuine time, and how does it how does time itself say work? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but maybe that is too ambitious. But what yeah. one thing that we can um, say because it's exactly in the line of what we've been saying. Is that I think uh, this parametric, you know, let's call it a par- parametric notion of time. Okay, time yeah. as, a, as a parameter, as an as a as a as a itself computable parameter, which how which uh, is then also a dimension for computing everything else. So that is the, the parametric time is that, and you can see, for instance, in in, in scientific models and so on, it, time has that function. It's 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 a resource for computation. The, the thing is that I think the, the first thing that we need to appreciate and then interrogate and ask ourselves, what does it imply, is precisely the fact that here we have time as a dimension which is independent of man. So the independence of man is the really, it's, it's the thing that should strike us. I mean, what, what does that mean? That we um, have as the, the truth about time um, a knowledge that, Starts from the assumption and, for, and, and, and knowledge uh, for which it is an, an evidence that time is 
a parameter out there. And then uh, this form of knowledge tries to explain nowadays, for instance, the emergence of this, uh, of this uh, phenomenon, but it's something independent of man. And the thing is that uh, the metaphysical attempts to understand time, yeah. those few that we have, clearly all of them understand time as something which is only in relation to man, in particular on the basis of a certain understanding of being. So I think one of the tasks that today we have, even if the, the, the kind of thinking that we necessarily need to try to attempt to build is not a metaphysical one anymore, is precisely to bring back into our awareness these metaphysical attempts, and here clearly I'm talking in the first place about, uh, about Aristotle, um, and it, it's, I, I think, really necessary and ineludible that we attempt to, um, to gain a new, a, 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 a new all for the first time and understanding, for instance, of what Aristotle was trying to do. My colleague Gino Zaccheri has made important contributions uh, in that direction. And be, why is that uh, ineludible? Because in a way we can then observe how, take, our, take Aristotle, who is immensely difficult to understand. I mean, two lines of Aristotle are enough for an academic career of 40 years. Um, and hardly anybody can read any Aristotle uh, nowadays. Um, you can observe how, take Aristotle, try to understand what he's saying, then take away everything that he says in terms of the involvement of the human being, which for, for Aristotle, there is no time without the mind. It's, it's, it's the, the capacity of letting appear of the mind that, yeah. that gives meaning to what he then describes in terms of this tension of before and after and so on, which in his physics. So take away the relation to man and you get this strange thing suspended in the air of, you get what then Einstein takes as the structure of this uh, succession yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is ordered according to the criterion and before and after, which he says, Einstein says, we cannot go behind behind that. We can, that. There is nothing behind that to interrogate. And we start from there, and then we go on with our attempt to build this functional theory of time, which he, then, he for instance, then does in terms of, um, in, in relativistic terms and so on. So it's very, um, not only instructive, but it's ineludible, I think that, and also a manner for, for us to, to um, reappropriate ourselves of, um, um, a, a, I think, more sufficient way of, for instance, approaching the, uh, such a fundamental phenomenon as the phenomenon of time, to exercise our, our capacity for reading on these uh, metaphysical sources, uh, something which, which we can do, but I think also we we need to do but just because we are we are growing into a, a, a thinking habit in which it is natural to us uh, to think of these phenomena to overlook <laughs> this uh, this fundamental in, involvement of the human being, also in generating, for instance, the historical perspective because that's something which is generated. It's it's within Ereignis as well that this historical perspectives is generated right yeah. and um, we, we uh, our to get back to your initial question also our perspective then on the tradition of philosophy becomes one which then which which you described before in which we just you know we just it's like just like a supermarket where we go and uh, yeah. Metaphysical supermarket. Yeah. We go, oh, I like that, a, a, a bit of that taste. It's yes. like, and then we make our recipe and uh, yeah, <laughs> cook something. Yeah, um, but then, then my question is, what is because you mentioned we have to reappropriate, for example, Aristotle. And you you said you could always say we have to get, we have to understand time. Um, it's like a, make a way a to fiction. understand time. Sorry, it's it's like a gym. I mean, we need it's it's an ex it's a it's a exercise. Yes. It's exercising, you know, exercising in 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 that, that kind of thinking, because clearly, the moment you do this today, you can, you don't do it in a Greek way. So, you are in trying to understand Aristotle, you are possibly unknowingly, or you know, you are already trying to build the kind of you know mobility and uh, the agility and so on in order to then get to a different understanding of time which is not which is 
and the attempt that Heidegger made, because it's an attempt, hmm? the yeah. attempt that he made, uh, because he went through 20 years of Aristotle before, of this gym, you know, um, already from his different stands, non not metaphysical stands anymore. So the attempt that he makes goes in a completely, completely different direction. Be why? Because Aristotle's understanding of time is what it is on the basis, uh, in, in, in a metaphysical setting, that is to say, it is based on a certain understanding of uh, the being of beings or the beingness of beings of of usia it's it's the notion of it's notions of usia and physis then together with kinesis in which this um, understanding of time is articulated mm -hmm. but in order for us to uh, to even see those uh, those um, those fundamental uh, traits uh, that then have the names uh, usia physis kinesis uh, metabole and so on well, we, we need to we need to be able to move in this in this in this metaphysical dimension. And how many ways are there to? In, there are infinite ways, but the, the the ways to, or what what is required for us to be able to have a dialogue with metaphysics in terms of this exercise that I was referring to before is that we have some ourselves some kind of stance in the same but a different one. And Heidegger is just one. So the one that we, it's the one example that we have. Um, but if you are not read, if you are not rooted in the same, but in a, in a, in a different way, namely in a way which allows you to, to look at this, this structure without you, you yourself be thinking within this structure in the first place. Yeah. Um, if if you don't have that, then how, how what kind of fruitful or fertile reference to to metaphysics can there can there be? None. I mean, it can only be either ignoring it because it doesn't have anything to say anymore, or making that use of uh, the historical use of it that we were describing before. Yeah, yeah. So, um, how as you mentioned before for Heidegger and for Aristotle for both in, in different ways time is meaningful to us for Aristotle it needs the mind for Heidegger it needs the response of the human being you could perhaps say what how is that though to be distinguished from a crude uh, subjectivism in the sense that time is just a, a construct of uh, the human mind um, which is something that you know that people theorize as well um, how would we could we distinguish from such an assumption um, that time needs the needs the human being and the other way around, but it isn't anchored in us? Mm -hmm. Well, what would be required in order to do that is once again to have a rigorous understanding of what we uh, mean when we say subjectivism. Mm -hmm. So we would have to have first of all a, a rigorous understanding of what the subject is. We, have, we would have to understand that the subject is a notion that only makes sense within a modern setting, mm, that uh, we would have to give a rigorous metaphysical determination of what the subject is. But this, this is from there, then it, yeah. yeah. So that this is just quite important because what in, in this historical balcony uh, perspective that, that we can all take on in any second, right? Um, what, what tends to happen is the, the human subject, it's, it's, Aristotle just describes a certain way of subjectivity or subjectivism, etc. So but I think making these distinctions very clearly is something that happens all too rarely and not, is never spelled out, is that what, the subject only makes sense in what we call the epoch that we refer to as modernity. So yeah, sorry, there's just an, an Yeah, but, but the historical eye is itself a... a, a not only a product, but it's the culmination of yeah. this, this um, sub of subjectivism in in a, in a metaphysical sense, yeah. because it, it it's uh, it's um, an instance of uh, the subject object relation. So, and and it, to to diagnose the historical eye is a way in which you see that something like uh, those objects that we have there, with regard to which we are just these unparticipating witnesses, yeah. those. That their objectivity and their being their disposal requires a subjective grounding. So it's only in a 
on a, on a, on the on the basis of um, subjectivity that we can have this kind of subject object relation, which, for instance, is the um, and, and 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 but significantly for us today is this historical is this historical regard, um, and then you know that we. we Part of this um, characterization of subjectivism would mean to be well uh, would would uh, imply um, it, and uh, would involve that we also um, characterize what is um, thought of as well, when you say oh you know subjectivist and only inside of us what is the correlate to that you know what the so called outside world are you thinking of something which in Kantian terms we, we would have to describe as a thing in itself, hmm? uh, because that's what, what we very often do. We have this subject-object relation, this version of it in which we have either uh, our mind, and, uh, or we have, one doesn't know how it gets, how it, what it is, and so on, but it is this outside world, you know, the world out there which is given in itself. Huh? Uh, and then the thing is then, if we think in terms of, the subject uh, closed into itself, the outside world given into itself, then what do we have? Well, clearly, then we have a problem of asking, well, how do these things go together? What can go wrong? Uh, what can be the de deceptions and distortions in all this? But that is the fact that we have that problem is the consequence, once again, of a certain, let's say, metaphysical position, which yeah. we would have to interrogate in the first place. So, um, needless to say that uh, what Heidegger attempts in terms of a really, really a first attempt, I mean, it's a first small yes. attempt, um, for instance, in, then in Zeit und Sein, in this late, uh, late text, or already clearly the preparation is in, in these posthumous, in these unpublished um, and, and recently published manuscripts. Yeah. Um, it has nothing to do with... Uh, any kind of subjectivism or subject. It's, a, it's all Dasein. <laughs> it's all Dasein. <laughs> now it's, it's, it, the, again, the reason I ask is because you, you can get all these connotations, associations, uh, very, because this is how I guess uh, well operated. Um, but to... <laughs> To bring this back to the the essay on uh, the end of philosophy and the beginning of thinking, <laughs> and the task of thinking. Uh, sorry, uh, so the end of philosophy and the task of thinking is what is it that Heidegger sees, even just in a preparatory manner, uh, as the task of thinking to come. Well, there again, uh, we can give a. A, a technical answer, meaning that if you um, um, give a rigorous um, have if you give a rigorous, uh, let's call it definition of, of metaphysics, or if you have a rigorous notion of metaphysics, yes. then you can also indicate what the task of metaphysics is, and uh, you can then differentiate in uh, this same task of metaphysics, which we, before we described in terms of this structure of beginning from beings going beyond and then so coming back you can differentiate and you can see how this, how is this articulated in in greek antiquity and what does it become um in modern times namely becomes a matter of subjectivity precisely so this this beyondness is precisely subjectivity uh, which yeah. then is the basis of uh, the, this subject object uh, relation um and and uh, you, you are already doing this. You are already um, carrying out this reconstruction of the Geschichte of, of metaphysics from um, from a from a perspective in which, as Heidegger says, what remains implicit and what is always presupposed in this metaphysical movement um, is, on the other hand, experienced, and it is even. The, the 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 beginning and the dimension of your own interrogating and the, and he he once he has rigorously indicated the um, metaphysical task of thinking or what he calls the sache yeah. we can see in english the sake of thinking yeah. because 
the same world, but also when you say for the sake of something. So metaphysics thinks for the sake of the beingness of beings. Yeah. Mm? So the, its sake is the beingness of beings and the, 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 the principle of that beingness in terms of a ground. And then he says, well, there is uh, the way, he has a very economical way of getting to the point, but which we cannot now um, replicate here uh, quickly. But eventually he gets, he can show how, and he takes Hegel and um, Husserl there specifically uh, as occasions for showing that, you can show how um, in the way in which metaphysics pursues its sake, mm, this, in modern philosophy, the sake of subjectivity, yeah. and particularly in the way in which uh, something like evidence or coming to light is presupposed, yeah. Yeah. or more generally um, in human think in, in modern thinking, the way in which natural light, you know, the light of reason, is involved, um, there is presupposed a, di- a now let's call it once again a dimension within which this coming to light within which this becoming evident, for instance, for Husserl in an original intuition, takes place. There is something which metaphysics avails itself of or draws upon, but which it does not focus on. It's like out of focus, but metaphysics constantly necessarily avails itself of that dimension which must, so to speak, already be in place, but with the involvement of man always, not by itself, in order for those, those ways of, uh, up, coming into appearance, for instance, in the subjective environment, can take place, and this dimension he calls Lichtung. And so now, this the the shi- the the focus shifts. It's a very slight shift from metaphysics to now. It's not something yeah. where you say, okay, you walk away from all of that. No, it's yeah. really it's like the slightest of shifts in which suddenly you focus on that thing which was not uh, in view before, and suddenly that becomes your sake. And it becomes your sake of how the sake becomes of how things come into appearance and into being within this dimension. And in the first place, how this dimension is upheld uh, in a relation of the human being to its, um, its, um, its, its principle, let's call it like this. And so the sake shifts to what he calls Lichtung und Anwesenheit. We can say clearance and let's say, abidingness. Hmm? So it's, once again, it's something which, it's very hands-on. It's not something you say, oh, what is now? Let's let's see, what could be the task? I mean, it's, you know, you have to go and look. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Just maybe to mention this, what I find also a bit, uh, say, interesting, is that the history of being, and I say this on purpose, um, has itself become or is being historicized, is that this necessarily needs to happen, right? That there are certain, um, say, scholars or readers of Heidegger who would say, don't don't worry, the history of being, Seinsgeschichte, just means that there are different ways of understanding being. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's not uh, it's immune, this way of thinking, to being historicized itself and becoming part of this larger operation of just finding certain things interesting and other things not interesting and certain things relevant and other things not relevant. I think um, a, a, there is a therapeutic uh, step could be the, the, the moment in which we actually f- f- find, a, first of all, understand what is uh, what Heidegger means by Geschichte and that we yep. maybe get to a point in which we find another word for that and stop talking about Geschichte because then it's, then suddenly the, the, the the thing breaks down maybe you can because the moment you don't call that history anymore yeah, yeah. Then this little game uh yeah. gone i mean so yeah yeah clearly you have to you, everything is historicized but including heidegger's thinking uh, there is an operate i mean because it's natural i mean there is nothing how could this not happen um there is an it's a little industry, a small industry. It's not such a big industry. It's a small to medium-sized industry that is involved in historicizing Heidegger's thinking. Fine. Yeah, yeah. No, but what could be that that other word for Geschichte? Oh. 
every, there is an open uh, competition for that, and we yeah. should maybe we should we should um, we should do some crowdfunding and try to to gather some money for for a prize for the best. Uh, I, I I I I don't want to talk about this now. I I, I tried this uh, to, to just to make a suggestion, but my yeah. suggestion is is more. I, my te- my concern is to raise uh, an awareness or to help to raise an awareness for the urgency of this because um, there is really yeah. I, I I try never to over um, rate or to over emphasize you know the w- words as if they were something sacred. In the case I must say in the case of uh, Geschichte, there I really say look until we don't have another word because the word history is so there is so much involved in it in terms of it immediately introduces us into, into the historical view in which we are, which is already so familiar to us. So we don't even know, realize how familiar it is. So that is an instance where I really would say, let's stop, you know, all philosophy departments and let's have a moratorium, you know, stop for a moment and say, look, we need to find another, word. try to understand what that means and then find another word for it. Because, Otherwise, we're never going to get out of this with the word history. And the, the, the word urgency, which was just, but, but, the, but urgency in, in what sense? I mean, non urgency, of course, in the sense I take it to just to have a, a proper Heidegger scholarship, but urgency for, for our epoch is that we need to understand what is meant when the thinker called Heidegger speaks of Geschichte and why this becomes not, 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 not theoretically, you see what I'm trying to say is this, it's not scholarly important. It's, it's important for, for, for Dasein, for, for, for us and in, in what is to come. To do, well, to do our job as human beings. The thing yes, is that exactly. we are yeah. in the middle of it yeah. and we are as far away as possible from an just adequate or sufficient response in terms of thinking to it. Yeah. That is for the human being always. I mean, I, I guess that's what the human being is. That's for the human being always a, b- a bad situation to be in when in our thinking does not is, is not responsive to what what on on an, on on the other hand we cannot not respond to. We are already in a way responding to it to it, and yet our thinking is not there where we already are, but but is somewhere else. Or again, that's. Heraclitus says nothing. He, you know, yeah. could, keeps on saying this. Look, guys, the logos. Try, let's try to focus on that because we are already, you know, involved in it. So we might as well focus on it. But, but so the sense of is the sense of urgency again for Heidegger. There, there is in 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 his writings. There's always this. There is a sense of urgency. There is. We need to think. We need to ask. And in, in, in Gelassenheit, he says, it, it seems that modern man is trying to attempt or is, is attempting to flee from thinking. And at the same time, what he sees being built is Weltzivilisation, a world civilization, according to um, what he says is European philosophy, at a time where. <laughs> Europeans or European thinking is cut off from its origin, um, and and hence again is is what is it that? And Heidegger very clearly sees what's I guess about to to come, and in terms of techno- techniques, uh, is that what would be a, a res- what could be ways of responding to the challenges? of this epoch that we can refer to as the epoch of techniques and the, the historical epoch. Yeah, but, but uh, I think we were at this point already. Um, I think fr- from the point of view of somebody who is involved um, in the way he or she can in this business of, of thinking, there is an urgency, but no pressure. It's there, the only response is, trying as honestly as one can and as much as one can and as much as one's possibilities uh, allow one to do so to think what is that is the the only response and there is no um try to do that uh, if if you can do it then try to do it 
Uh, and in, in that kind of position, also you, you, can, you, un, you have an understanding of how it is completely possible to foresee anything, how it is completely possible to try to steer anything and so on. You recognize that, for instance, it would be good if, you know, a certain, it, it's, it's, we, get, we, we make progress if there is a few people who do that and it's not just uh, one or two because uh, if it's you, you get a sense of, for the fact that well if it was you know if we could work uh, uh, among different people um, we one could help each other and so on you get a sense for that but you also get a sense of how things there the, the time you don't decide the time or how quickly you um, you can advance uh, if we can speak of advancing and so on that is one thing um, and you you know that you're the last one who should say something about um, you know now we should you know take this action or that action. Yeah, you really get a very very strong sense of how you should, you should, you should not do that. On the other hand, you get a sense for for the fact that if one is alerted to let's say what is going on in terms of sense, the the fact of being alerted to that in some way, even if in immediate way. So you, without, for instance, being oneself involved in, in the uh, craft, you know, the yeah. fact being alerted to that, that, uh, that is not something bad because it induces um, a kind of moderation, you know, of, it, it helps to get away from what before we described as the exclusiveness. And you, you, you know, you, gaining a certain kind of uh, freedom from the way in which things work, this, at, I think it's, one can say that it, it could help to um, avoid some, maybe some, some the worst damage. Mm-hmm. So um, in, in this sense, there is a usefulness to, to there would be a usefulness to um, an, an adequate um, mediation of, I think, of this attempt here, of this diagnostical attempt, because um, getting a sense of it um, has this uh, moderating effect or that some kind of, you know, or even giving back to us the capacity to wonder about what is going on and not just obsessively just being involved in both in implementing it, but including just the way in which we look for solutions can, yeah. can I think, profit from that. Those people who do the necessary and important job of trying to uh, you know, make sure that the worst doesn't happen, you know, in terms of our self, uh, self-destruction, I yeah. think it is, it is helpful if you have a sense of the non-exclusiveness of what is going on, because otherwise you, you, know, you can have, uh, in, uh, in terms of finding an equilibrium, you can have a, the panic reaction, which is never a good thing, uh, or you know, the thing you can get to th- come to think that only, you know, only if I destroy humanity, I can save the the earth because you know I don't know something extreme. I mean, it's it, in terms of deep, deep, uh, de- deep depowering. You know, what's the opposite of empowering? Depowering extremism and uh, so on. D- thinking can have a I think can be beneficial in, in in those terms. I think, yeah, yeah. And that's I, also why it makes sense to 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 try to get rid of some mis- misconceptions. Or or you you cannot do anything against historicizing, which is really a, from the point of view of thinking something really. I mean, there is few things that are m- more useless than that. But um, trying to at least. Um, introduce a perspective which is not this the, this historicizing one um, maybe it can help in 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 this um, in this task of uh, there, I think there are multiple mediations which which have to happen in order for for for, for thinking to be effective and uh, because um, and, and, if, and if because one you know Heidegger he goes on many levels you know there are texts in which he tries but you know one the same one who is very busy in a certain place um, at a certain uh, point of this uh, this chain of production, let's call it in industrial terms. You yeah. know, you cannot do all the jobs. You cannot do all everything. So, um, 
um, but, but I, I think it, it makes sense to, um, to contribute to um, making this mediation possible.